but it's not true. That a small community with a small military force being attacked by massive armies from the outside is able to conquer an entire country, destroy hundreds and hundreds of towns and villages, and force almost a million people into exile. And then we take a look at the details a little bit closer. And what we find is this. The two communities who lived in Palestine at the time, the Jewish community, like I said, mostly immigrants, and the Palestinian community were both expecting to become state. They both had institutions of state. But there was one thing in which the, the Zionist community invested heavily and the Palestinians did not. And that's a military force. By that time, the military force, the Zionist militia, of which my father, in which my father was a, an officer, numbered close to 40,000 well-armed, well-trained, and very well-indoctrinated men ready to fight, ready to claim this country that they believed was theirs. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. So who are these armies that attacked? And what did they attack exactly with? We know that our other Arab armies intervened in Palestine later on, in May, June of, 19, of, of 1948, six, seven months later. But who are the Arabs that attacked them? Because there was no military force. There was no military force for the, Pal in the, the Palestinians never had one. And then we come to realize that they didn't attack. The Zionist militia began a massive campaign of ethnic cleansing as soon as the United Nations resolution was accepted. And within 12 months, they conquered 80% of the country. They forced almost a million people into exile and they destroyed close to 500 towns and villages. Wiped them off the face of the earth. Some of them were as old as a thousand years, had a very long history. And now the story makes sense. You have one community with a massive military force, one community that has civilians, and it makes sense why the one with the military force would win, would prevail. Palestinians had no, no, no expectation that there, was going to be a, 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 that there was going to be this kind of an attack. And this, is exactly, and this is exactly the catastrophe. Now, one of the things I did in this book, in my book, is I went from kind of, it was a memoir, so it talks about my family and their, and their involvement in the state of Israel and their involvement in this issue, and then and then the story and the history of the, of the conflict itself. And there's a story about my mother. This is a picture of my mother when she was young. She's 86 years old now. And she was born and raised in Jerusalem. And she knew the city very well, and she knew the communities, the different neighborhoods, including the Palestinian neighborhoods, what they call the Arab neighborhoods, uh, very well. And in 1948, when the Zionist forces took these neighborhoods, now we're, I'm not talking about the old city of Jerusalem. There are many neighborhoods and large populations lived outside in, in, in newer neighborhoods. When the Zionist forces took these neighborhoods, they of course forced the Palestinians to leave, and their homes, which are by the way still standing, these neighborhoods are still there in Jerusalem. If you've been to Jerusalem, you've seen them. These are very distinct, very beautiful homes. And they were offered to Israeli families. Now, my mother was a, my, my mother was a young mother at the time. She had uh, she had my, my two older siblings, she was living in a small apartment with her mother, and her husband, my father, was fighting for the cause, he was out in the front, he was an officer, so she was offered one of these homes. And she told me this story when I was a child, I don't know when, but I remember hearing this story many, many times as I grew up. And as I was working on the book, I discussed this, and I talked about, and I, you know, I, I, I talked about this uh, with my mother many times. And her reaction to the story, to her reaction when she talks about it, is, 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 is the same, the same emotional reaction. And the way she puts it is that, how could I possibly take the home of somebody, of another mother? How could I possibly move into the home of a family that is now forced to live in exile? And then she would describe and she would say, the loot, to see the, truck of, uh, the truckloads of loot, she said, I don't know how they weren't ashamed. I felt a sense of shame for these Israeli soldiers with the truckloads of loot, because these were well-to-do homes with furniture and rugs and so forth. And the story was that the coffee was still warm on the table when the Israeli soldiers came in. And almost every time I tell the story in a lecture, there's somebody in the audience who was either from one of these homes as a child or has parents who had a home like that in Jerusalem, in these neighborhoods. Now, what's interesting about the story is not just that she made the right choice, the choice that you would hope all people would make. Of course, they didn't, but you wish they would. What's interesting about the story for me is that it bothered me for many, many years. 
And I couldn't quite pinpoint why it was bothering me until I was actually working on the book and I had time to, to really think about it and talk to her about it. Her story was, was, a, was contradicting the national narrative. It was presenting a moral issue. And the, because the national narrative is that they attacked, they, the Arabs attacked, we won and they left. Well, if that's the story, there's no moral issue. There's no moral problem here. Why can't we take their homes? They attacked, we won, they left. Nobody forced them. But what she was saying is that we did something wrong. But not only was she saying that we did this something wrong, she was saying that we did something wrong and, she is, and she, there's no justification at the end of the story. Because when Israel, even when Israel admits wrongdoing against the Palestinians, there is always a but. There's always an explanation. Yes, the massacre of the Yassin was a terrible thing, but thankfully that created mass uh, exodus of Palestinians from other, from other places. And so we were able to create a Jewish majority. So even though this was a terrible thing, in the end it turned out better for us, which is what's important. She was telling me the story and there was no but. And it's very rare in Israeli discourse to hear any story that presents the Palestinians as equals to other people. In other words, if something is wrong morally, it's wrong morally, even if you do it to Palestinians. You never hear that. And of course, all this I, I understood and I realized much later on in life, as I was, like I said, as I was working on the book. Now, at the end of 1948, the map looked like this. So, almost 80% of Palestine became Israel. The West Bank was part of the uh, uh, Kingdom of Jordan. And the Gaza Strip was part of Egypt. 20 years later, in 1967, the drums of war are beating again. President Nasser of Egypt enters his forces into the Sinai Peninsula, violating the ceasefire agreement with Israel, threatens to close the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping boats going up to the port city of Elat. And the drums, like I said, the drums of war are beating. The Israeli generals at that time saw this as an opportunity for war. Now, these generals, 20 years later, were the young commanders of 1948, including my father. By 1967, the early 60s, they were all generals. And they were the ones who were leading and preparing the Israeli army, the Israeli military. So my father was one of those generals. And as the, as, as the Egyptians were bringing their forces in, there was this debate between the Israeli cabinet and the Israeli military, what to do. The Israeli cabinet was kind of looking for a diplomatic way out. The Israeli generals wanted war. They said this was a cause for war. And it's interesting because the Israeli cabinet was made of mostly immigrants from Eastern Europe who were in their late 60s, early 70s. The Israeli generals, were all, almost all of them were born in Palestine. They all served in the militia in 48. They were in their early to mid 40s. They were this new creation that the Zionists wanted to create, this new testosterone-filled Jew, ready to fight, ready to, you know, ready to be assertive. In the end, as I'm sure you know, the generals prevailed. And what we hear about this war is that there was an existential threat. In other words, Israel attacked first. Everybody agrees. Everybody accepts that. Israel engaged in a preemptive strike. However, there was a, an existential threat. The Arab armies were once again presenting Israel with a threat to its very existence. And therefore, the Israeli forces had no choice but to attack. Well, in my... Like I see, the, the, the title of my book is The General Son. This is the general, by the way, my father. And in, my, in preparation, as I was working on the book, I went into the Israeli Army Archives to learn about his career. And particularly, I found interesting, were the minutes of the meetings of the generals leading up to the 1967 war. Now, a lot of people have seen them. A lot of people have written about them. Historians, Israeli historians and others have written about this. Many books, documentaries about that period leading up, you know, the spring and early summer of 1967, what actually took place. So I wasn't really expecting to see anything new. However, as I began reading those minutes, I saw something that struck me that I had not seen anywhere else. This is something that my father says in these meetings and several of the other generals say as well. And they were talking about a war with Egypt, of course. And they're saying the Egyptian army is not prepared for war. President Nasser is bringing forward is advancing forces that are not prepared for war. They will need at least a year and a half to two years before they are prepared for war. We are now presented with an opportunity to destroy the Egyptian army once again. They say this, and then they say it again, and then they say it again. 
in these meetings among themselves and in meetings with cabinet members. Not a single word about a threat, certainly not an existential threat, but an opportunity to once again assert Israeli strength. Where's the threat? Where's the threat? Where's the existential threat we all heard about? Where did that come from? Well, that came later, for political reasons. So like I said, as we all know, the Israeli cabinet gave the okay. The Israeli army attacked the Egyptians. Within a matter of days, the Egyptian army was destroyed. The Sinai Peninsula was taken. The generals on their own decided to take the West Bank and the Golan Heights. The West Bank, these generals, who, like I said, were the young commanders of 48, taking the West Bank for them was finishing the job, finish, finishing the job of 1948. They were very frustrated that the, that the West Bank was not taken by Israel in 1948, because Israel had the ability to do it, but for political reasons, they chose not to. To them, this was a very sore spot, and they wanted to finish the job, and they did, and they took the West Bank. And for, for, uh, for different reasons, mostly because of water and, and so forth, they wanted to take the Golan Heights as well. And they did. Now, the two stories diverge here. Again, the Israeli narrative, the Israeli story is, we were under an existential threat. We defeated three Arab armies once again. Again, David and Goliath, again the Maccabees and so forth. And in six days, we not only prevailed, but the size of the state of Israel tripled. I mean, the state of Israel tripled in size. Three Arab armies were destroyed and, you know, we prevailed once again. The reality, the more, the, 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 the details of the, of, of, of the battle, is the, of, of, the, of what took place is that there was no existential threat. There was an opportunity to attack. The Arab armies were in shambles. They were not prepared for war. The Israeli military took advantage of that and they were able to, take, to destroy three Arab armies, triple the size of the state of Israel, take the West Bank, which they always wanted, killed more than 15,000 Arab soldiers in six days at a loss of 700 soldiers to the Israeli military. Now every soldier that dies is somebody's son, so it breaks your heart. At the same time, the difference between 15,000 and 700 says it all. Now, what took place after that is very interesting. What took place after that was very interesting. This was the map at the end of 1967. As soon as the West Bank was taken, Israel began a massive campaign of destruction and ethnic cleansing, and at the same time building for Israelis only in the West Bank, which is exactly what Israel did at the end of 1948. In other words, they finished the job. The process that took place after 1948, massive destruction, massive expulsions, and building for Israeli Jews only, happened once again precisely in the same way in the West Bank. And the West Bank was integrated into the rest of Israel. Cities and towns were built for Israelis only. Massive, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forced to leave. Destruction of, of villages and towns and homes and so forth. The exact same process. Now, when we take a closer look at it, we see that the mission that was accomplished was, number one, to conquer Palestine so that Israel, the, the, so that Israel could have it and give it to the Jewish people. That was accomplished. Ethnic cleansing to get rid of the people. These were the wrong people. This is our country, not theirs, so we have to get rid of them. And then to de-Arabize the country. Because this was an Arab country for 1,500 years and it's very difficult to live in an Arab country with Arab monuments and Arab names and claim that this is yours when you're not an Arab. So there's a process of changing the names, destroying monuments, and this is a process that takes, has been taking place every single day over the last 65 years, including today. And this is again, like I said, the same process that took place after 48 took place exactly after the War of 67, which really brings home the fact that Israel never had any intention and never will have any intention of ever parting from any part of the land of Israel. So when people talk about the possibility of an Israeli government ever allowing the Palestinians to establish a state in any part of that country is a complete misunderstanding and a complete misreading of what Israel is about and what Zionist ideology is about. The land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people, period, all of it. The Palestinians have to be, we have to get rid of, one way or the other. 
The notion that any Israeli government, I'll repeat that, will ever allow the creation of a Palestinian state in the West Bank is a result of a complete misunderstanding and misreading of what Israel is about, what Zionism is about. It cannot happen. And it hasn't happened, and, all the, uh, and like I said, the West Bank has been completely integrated into the state of Israel. And to give you one example of the de-Arabizing that's going on to this very day, if you've been to Jerusalem, if you've been to the Old City, you know where the Wailing Wall is, you step out, you go outside the walls, and you go down the hill, there's a community called Silwan. It's a community of 50,000 people. And if you, stand up, if you stand in the middle of the hill, on the one hand you see the Old City, you see the Jewish Quarter, which has been rebuilt and you know, become very grand. And at the very bottom of the hill, you see Silwan. And someone decided that the, that, the, that the true city of King David lies under the homes of the people in Silwan. Never mind the fact that there is no historical proof that there was a King David. But the homes of Silwan are being destroyed. The people of Silwan are being terrorized and forced to leave. And there's a, there's a new archaeological park called the City of David. And the, and the tourist buses are already there with tourists showing them this beautiful archaeological park where the true city of King David used to live. Now, the home, some homes were destroyed. The homes in the periphery are destroyed because of the digging, so their foundations are falling to pieces. And in the far, larger periphery, Israeli settlers are taking over other homes. A community of 50,000 people is being destroyed in order to somehow create this mythical connection between today's Israel and the ancient Hebrews and King David. 50,000 people. I live in, the, in a city in Sa in, in, near San Diego in the U.S. of less than 30,000 people. Can you imagine somebody coming and doing something like that? But you can do it because they're Palestinians. You can do it because they're Arabs. It's in broad daylight. Everybody can see it. Everybody knows it's happening. It's being funded by people. It's been funded by all kinds of NGOs from around the world. And of course, the Israeli military is there to support it. Now, something very interesting happened my, that my father did after he, or even before he retired from the military. As soon as the West Bank was taken, he stood up in the very first meeting of the uh, very weekly meeting of the, of the general staff, and he said, look, we now, you know, we conquered the land, we established ourselves as a, as a, as a power, now we have to resolve the Palestinian issue, we have to make peace with the Palestinians. We've taken over the land, but the people are still here. If we want to maintain Israel as a Jewish democracy, which is what we all fought for, we must allow the Palestinians... We must allow the Palestinians to establish their own independence within that country. And the West Bank and the Gaza Strip were a good place to do that. And then from that point, for the rest of his life, he broke away from his Israeli establishment. Because as he was saying this, the Israeli establishment was, like I said, uh, forcing Palestinians to leave, destroying towns and cities in the West Bank, and building for Israelis only, Israeli Jews only, in the West Bank. And for the rest of his life, he dedicated to the cause of allowing the Palestinians to create their own state in the West Bank, and for equal rights for the Palestinians who remained within Israel and were Israeli citizens, two causes in which he failed. Because Israeli, pa Palestinians who are Israeli citizens do not have equal rights, and as we know, there is no Palestinian state. And we're farther away today from a Palestinian state as we ever were. And my father, as, as, a, uh, as a civilian, along with other several Israelis who, were, you know, who, were, who had, who had um, made a name for themselves as, you know, in other areas, created a movement that began a dialogue in those days, this is in the mid-70s, began in the mid-70s, a dialogue with official members of the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. And this dialogue went on, and, and it, was, it, was, it was all secret. They would meet in Europe, they would meet in North Africa, and the whole idea was to discuss how this two-state solution was going to happen. Now, on the Palestinian side, these were official representatives of the PLO. These were Yasser Arafat's top people. On the Israeli side, these were notable names, but they were really renegades. They had no political power. They, had, they were representing no one. And whenever they would return, my father would always report to the prime minister. So the Israeli government knew what was going on. They were aware of this, and they would, would have nothing to do with it. In the early 80s, the Israeli Knesset, the parliament, passed a law making these contacts illegal. Of course, that didn't stop them from meeting. They would still go and meet. And then suddenly, in 1993, Israel decided to make peace with the PLO. I'm sure many of you remember the September of 1993 on the White House lawn. 
Yasser Arafat and Rabin shake hands and they sign the Oslo Accords. And you have to wonder what happened in 1993. Was there really such a big change? Did Rabin become a man of peace? Which is what people were saying. By 1993, the West Bank had been completely integrated into Israel. By 1993, Israel knew for sure that there was no way a Palestinian state could ever be established. And that is when they were willing to make peace with the PLO because they knew it would lead to nothing. They brought the PLO in to sign the Oslo Accords not to make peace. They brought them in to sign a surrender, which is why it didn't work. And it took a couple of years for many people to realize this. But that was the process of Oslo. It wasn't the process to, to bring peace and end up with two-state solution. It was a process to bring the Palestinians to sign a surrender. My father passed away in 1995 and, of cancer, and before he died, there was a big interview with him in one of the Israeli papers, and the headline was, Mati Pellet says, Rabin does not want peace. This was the end of 1994, beginning of 1995. In those days, to say that Yitzhak Rabin did not want peace meant you were completely insane. I mean, how could anybody say that Rabin does not want peace? He shook the hands of Arafat. He shook the hands of the devil. But my father read the Oslo Accords, as did several others, Edward Said and several other people who, who opposed it. And they said this was not going to lead to peace. And the very last article my father wrote was called uh, A Requiem to Oslo. It was published right after his death. Now, in the year 2000, you may recall, President Clinton brought in Yasser Arafat and the Israeli Prime Minister, who by then was Ehud Barak, who everybody thought was a man of peace. They all got together at Camp David trying to close the deal. And they went on negotiating for days and days and days, and then they came out with nothing. And Bill Clinton said, well, the Palestinians gave some, but the Israelis gave more. Blaming the failure of the negotiations on the Palestinians. Because of what? Because the Palestinians were not willing to make concessions. Look at the map. By agreeing to the two-state solutions, the Palestinians gave up 80% of their homeland. And they gave up the right of the refugees to return. And they recognized the very state that destroyed their homeland and forced them to live as refugees. They were not willing to make concessions? What Arafat was not willing to do was sign a surrender agreement. That's what Arafat was not willing to do. Clinton and Ehud Barak wanted to bring him down to his knees and he refused. And for that he was vilified. Yasser Arafat was probably the most consistent voice for peace in the Middle East for 30 years. Until the day he died, which is uh, 2004. But he was surrender. The best any Israeli government was ever 